Okay, thanks for the uh, invitation and thanks very much to uh, the previous speaker for showing that if you want to determine if something is effective or not, you test it against placebo. Where it's a no-brainer, it's a great study, it gets published in the New England Journal and we know now how, exactly how well it works. And that's the way it should be, but it's not done in surgery. And it's not even often thought of as being done in surgery, although that is changing a lot now. And in the last few years, and certainly since I started practice, this has changed significantly. But it did start a long time ago, and it actually started back in 1959, and here again, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, is a study that tested a very common technique for treating angina. It was internal mammary artery ligation done through an open incision in the chest. And it was a common operation done for 20 years until they published this study where they randomized patients to have the artery ligated or to have exactly the same procedure, including the incision, including the placement of a suture, except they didn't tie it. So it's a beautifully constructed placebo study where every intervention was exactly the same except the key ingredient was removed and that was ligation of the artery itself. And it showed no benefit whatsoever from this treatment. That's 1959, the treatment stopped, and that's the way things should be done. Unfortunately, nothing happened after that in the field of surgery for many, many years, for over 40 years. And it was when I was in practice as an orthopedic surgeon when this uh, really bombshell article dropped. Um, and this was the first placebo-controlled trial in my field of musculoskeletal surgery I'd ever heard of. And it created you know, great waves. Um, and it was just looking at arthroscopy, a fairly simple procedure done through you know, small incisions. And it showed that it made no difference whatsoever to the patients whether you did the arthroscopy clean up or just pretended to. And it's very interesting because of the results that it showed. And if you look at it, there's no difference between the two groups. But if you have a look at it, or three groups in this case, everybody got better. And that's the thing that drives surgery. We see people get better and we attribute that improvement to our surgery when here you see they're just as likely to get better if they didn't actually get the procedure. So when I first read this, it just you know, opened up my mind as to well, what else are we doing? that doesn't work. We don't know because nobody's testing it against placebo. But again, it wasn't a long time until more studies were done. And in my field, it was 2013, Boxing Day 2013, that this article came out. And this is another one looking at knee arthroscopy, but this time looking at meniscectomy. And this is probably, in fact, knee arthroscopy is the most common orthopedic procedure performed in the world. There's a, a million performed every year in the US alone. This is a really common procedure. It's one of the most common surgical procedures in the world. And they show that the most common procedure in the world didn't work at all compared to placebo. It's exactly the same results. And this is an extremely high quality study. And I was amazed that um, you know, such a good quality could be done in the field of surgery. But again, look, people got better. And until now, I used to do this operation. I'd been attributing that improvement to my surgery. And this told me that it wasn't the surgery. They would have got better if I hadn't done it. And I have since found that to be true in my own practice. But this uh, was a, a, a great study. But did it change anything? Did it, you know, how much impact did it have? Um, if you look at the quality of the study, this review of studies was done, and the red arrow there is against that study I just showed you. It's very rare when you're looking at a risk of bias table, particularly in surgical trials, to see all green lights. I mean, this study was such a good quality study that not only were the investigators blinded, the investigators wrote two versions of the manuscript based on whether placebo was group A or group B. And then each of the investigators signed a contract saying that they would not change that version of the manuscript once they were unblinded. And then they were unblinded, and then they submitted the version that they'd written while they were blinded. It's a very high quality study. But what impact did it have? 
This is a review we did in BMJ 2017, um, summarising all the evidence, because there's not just placebo studies, there's a lot of high quality RCTs done in the field, and we recommended against arthroscopic knee surgery in patients with degenerative knee disease, and also concluded that further research is unlikely to alter this recommendation. It's clear now, the jury is in and the jig is up. It doesn't work. There's been lots of murmurings, lots of editorials and articles um, looking at arthroscopy. Is it time to abandon ship? Do we have to stop doing it now? But it's also had this sort of reaction from the other side. And look at this. This is another systematic review of the evidence for operative management of meniscal tears. Now, this study showed that arthroscopy does not benefit people with meniscus tears. So the conclusion of the study was that there is an urgent need for studies that do show a benefit because we know that it works. This is how twisted the logic is. They're saying, sure, all the studies to date have shown that it doesn't work. So we really need to keep going here until we find the one study where it does work. More research is urgently needed to support meniscal surgery. That's actually written in the conclusion of an article in a journal recently. And this editorial in the journal called Arthroscopy, uh, by the editor of Arthroscopy, stated that patients who may not be of entirely sound mind are selected as research subjects in placebo-controlled surgical studies, and research performed on such individuals would not be generalizable to mentally healthy patients. So this is what we're up against. So have we made an impact? We looked at the data in New South Wales and we found a significant decline, a 48% decline in the knee arthroscopy rates in people aged over 50 between 2011 and 2017. A massive decline. I was really happy with this. This is fantastic. The message is getting out. We recently looked at the Australian data. Again, overall, big decline across the country. And there was like a 28% decline across the country. And I thought, gee, that's good. Then I thought, well, hang on a minute. If there's a 50% decline in New South Wales, which is a third of the country, what's happening to the other countries? In South Australia, the rate of knee arthroscopy has gone up in that population. So the message is not necessarily getting through, but it's certainly starting to. But what happened with the publication of these articles became um, the, the possibility that we can do these so sorts of studies, and so others came out. And these are three placebo-controlled trials on shoulder surgery, each of them showing that the surgery was no more beneficial than placebo. The first two were on the most common shoulder procedure performed in the world, subacromial decompression, and it doesn't work. Placebo-controlled trials and surgery have been reviewed, and there's some interesting findings from this. First of all, most of them show that the surgical treatment under investigation is no better than placebo. And certainly we're finding that with almost everything we study in musculoskeletal medicine uh, surgery. But it also found that placebo surgery is associated with less harm. Now, that, I guess that kind of makes sense when you think about it. But all these people arguing against placebo surgery, you're saying you can't do it because you're exposing people to potential harm. You go, okay, well, we won't do it. We'll just keep operating on them and expose them to greater harm without knowing whether it works or not. So that was an interesting finding. And why do we believe that surgery works when it doesn't? Well, there's an interesting phenomenon, which is this bias that physicians have that their treatment works. And we did some studies looking at joint replacement and looking at uh, tibia fractures. And we found in tibia fractures, for instance, um, uh, over two thirds of the surgeons were happy with the results of the surgery with particular patients. Then we asked the patients, less than half of them were happy with the results. This discrepancy carries on. This was studied at Bond University by Tammy Hoffman, looking at all studies that have been done like this, showing that physicians consistently overestimate the benefit and underestimate the harms of what they do compared to reality. So why do we still operate? Why are they doing more knee arthroscopies in South Australia than they ever have? Is it because they believe it to be effective? Is it because of patient demand? 
failure of non-operative treatment. These are all appealing things, you know, and this, was, this gets thrown at me all the time. They're saying, well, these patients have failed non-operative treatment, so therefore we have to try operative treatment. And you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess so. It kind of sounds logical until you think about it. If you've got an operation that doesn't work, it doesn't matter whether another treatment has worked or not. It still doesn't work. And yet this is the kind of logic that we, that we have. It's a lack of alternative. Surgeons say, well, if I can't do an arthroscopy, what am I supposed to do? Not considering, of course, that you don't have to do anything. And the other argument, so it's a placebo, who cares? If two thirds of my patients are getting better, I don't really care about the mechanism. Um, that's a whole nother lecture. Uh, so I'll skip over that. But largely it's not because of these excuses, and this is the problem. The main reason why surgeons still operate is because they believe it to be effective. They actually believe that what they're doing is working because they see people get better. They are like this quote from the American Academy of Medical Sciences, which says, physicians are not prepared to discard therapies validated by both tradition and their own experience based on someone else's numbers a study done in Finland. I know, I see with my own eyes people get better. And this is a quote from the American Journal of Medical Sciences from 1836, when they showed that bloodletting didn't work for pneumonia. They said, that's rubbish, it's worked for 2,000 years, we all know it works, we don't trust your numbers. And that's what's going on. So this perceived effectiveness is really this problem of correlation is not causation. And there's lots of graphs you can pull from the internet, like this one, which shows the association between polio and ice cream. And your immediate first thought is that, what is it in the ice cream that's causing polio? Is the virus in the ice cream? That's your first thought, without thinking that there's something else in common, like summer. And so what is this improvement not due to surgery? It's the logical fallacy of post hoc ergo propter hoc. It follows, therefore it is because of. This is a, a heuristic, it's a shortcut that has been built in to human thinking. This is what makes us so quick to jump to conclusions. And it's great, it got us here evolutionarily, but it's not scientific. It's human, it's not scientific. And believe me, humans are not scientific. It takes a lot of hard work to be scientific. And so it's really caused by three things. The natural history, a lot of things get better. This is the reason why every home cure for the common cold to date works. Regression to the mean, which I, I'm sure many of you are aware of. I don't have a lot of time to explain. And concomitant treatment. A lot of time people are getting other treatment at the same time. They're getting physio or whatever. And that's what makes them better particularly for those shoulder ones. So traditionally, what surgery relies on, and this is where surgery lies apart from the rest of medicine, it relies on plausible mechanisms. It sounds like it would work, that if I go into your knee and clean it up, you will feel better. I feel better when people clean up my house. You know, it just sounds good. Um, laboratory evidence, uh, observational studies. But what should we be using to determine effectiveness is the method with the least error. And reducing error when estimating the truth is to reduce random error and reduce systematic error. In other words, to do randomized trials with low risk of bias. And this is the difference between two knee arthroscopy papers. One is the lowest quality paper ever done on knee arthroscopy, which shows knee arthroscopy basically saves lives and it's the most effective treatment in the world. And the highest quality knee arthroscopy trial ever done, which shows no difference whatsoever. And this is why we need to do high quality studies because the low quality studies are biased towards it. So what are we doing about it? This is a, a, a local health district meeting. What are we doing about it? Well, we're doing two things. We're doing placebo trials. So the first one is the success trial, which is a placebo surgical trial of lumbar spine decompression. The first spine placebo study done in the world. And we've just put in a grant for the ARC trial, which is a placebo surgical trial of rotator cuff repair, which again is one of the most common operations done, period. So in summary, the perceived effectiveness of surgery is much greater than reality. Blinded placebo controlled trials offer the least biased measure of surgical effectiveness. We know that. You've seen it in the last lecture. Everybody knows that. But we don't apply it to surgery for some reason. Surgery has flown under the radar for too long. Most surgical procedures have not been subjected to blinded trials, and that's what we need to change. Thanks.